How's everybody doing this morning? There's a couple things that I need to do before I bring Pastor Toby up here. Uh, the, the first thing I need to do is that Tyler and I, as our, as our businesses, decided this year that we was going to sponsor a giveaway for the men's conference. Whoever brought the most people with them, kind of like back in the, in the children's church days, we get a chocolate bar or whatever. Well, me and Tyler decided that we was going to put up $125 a piece, and whoever brought the most people would get $250. If we went by that criteria, I would win, because I brought two people. But we're not going to go by that criteria. We're going to go by this criteria. I talked to Tyler about it. He was good with it. Kent Pearson is our winner this year. Kent, can you come up here? Hurry up. I don't have the money on me right now, but I will get it to you. It won't. The reason, the reason Tyler and I picked Kent is because a month before men's conference started, Kent came up to me and said, me and my dad is going to be at men's conference every day. I'm going to make sure that we're here. And he made sure that him and his dad were here at men's conference all three days. And that's what he started. The second thing I'm going to do is that the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. And I promise you as a musician, you can ask Robert, you can ask Brother Bobby, anybody that's ever been on this stage that stands up here, the most exciting and most awesomest time, if awesomeness is a word, is when <laughs> you don't have to do anything because the crowd is singing back to you. We talk, uh, Toby talked about this last song that we sang. He's like, man, that's my favorite song. That's the first song I've heard. It was my favorite song now. God inhabits the praises of the people. And I want to thank the band, all the men that came out. I want to thank y'all for showing up and showing out and letting God work through y'all. Third thing, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to show honor where honor is due, all right? And I know we don't like this, but our pastor deserves all the honor that we can give him. I thank you, Brother Bobby, for trusting some podunk kid from Holden, Louisiana, to be able to lead our men into a new place that he's called us to be. And so, much ado, our, our theme for this, this men's conference has been family. And I've learned in my life that not everybody that is blood is family. Amen. And not everybody that's family is blood. Toby Cox is my best friend in the world. It doesn't matter what happens in the last 22 years that we've known each other? He's seen my good side. He's seen my bad side. He's went through every valley and every mountaintop experience that I've ever went through in the last 22 years. And he was right there by my side. He is my family. He's not my friend. We, we, you say, he's my, I say he's my best friend, but he's my brother. And as he starts to come up here, I just want y'all to be blessed by this man of God because he truly is one of the greatest men of God that I've ever had the ability and privilege to walk with. And we took up the, we took up the offering. I told him not to do that. I told him to make, make you work for it first. <laughs> and then, because the Bible says the world is worth his wages. You got to work for it first. You only did, only did two thirds of the job before you got to finish the third. So, but Toby Cox. Amen. Yeah, but what you don't understand is sometimes you got to give in faith. 
Amen. Sometimes you gotta give in faith, expecting something. I, I, we we had a, a revival at our church not too long ago. I'm a pastor at Victory Church in Donna Vista, Florida. Uh, my father founded it 25 years ago, and and uh, and there was a pastor between him and myself. And April and I left uh, Louisiana to her great sadness because she was born and raised in Louisiana. My kids were born in Louisiana, and so she uh, we we went down there and, and about six years ago now. And uh, God is really doing some amazing things. But when we had a, a tent revival, we had an old school tent revival not too long ago. And, and what happened was uh, I kept telling my people that expectation breeds miracles. When you come expecting God to do something, he's going to do it. Hallelujah. He's going to do it. And so this morning, man, I, I want us to pray before we get started. And I'm going to go through a couple of things and then we're going to get into the word. But bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Father God. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy that you've given to us, Father. I ask right now that, that, that as I begin to speak, that you would anoint my words, because your words are already anointed, Father God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move through me, that you would soften hearts and prepare uh, for the word to come, Father. And I ask that we would all leave here different than we came in, Father. Yes. And I ask it now in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, the men's conference, as he said, it was about family. Um, and the first night, ladies, I'm going to go do a brief summary for you guys so you'll know what we talked about. Um, the first night, um, we talked about taking care of ourselves and getting ourselves right. I mean, you know, if you've ever been on an airplane, they say when the masks fall from the ceiling, get yourself right first so you can take care of somebody else, right? And so the first night we dealt with, uh, with, with the guys and we got all ourselves right, right? I figured the ladies would be like, hey, man, y'all need to get right. It didn't happen. And then, but, um, then the next day we talked about the family and about what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do for our family as men of God. And today, uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, and, and I, got, I have to premise it with this, man. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't been become a part of the family, today is the day of salvation is what the scripture says. Do it today. Do it today. You can do it right there where you sit. Say, God, I accept what your son did for me. Make me new. Because he didn't come to make you better or to repair you. He came to make you new. Right? And so there needs to be a newness in our lives when we give it to him. It's called repentance. Repentance is taking, going from here and turning and going a different direction. Right? He doesn't want to just turn you a little bit. He wants to change your direction. Okay? And so, um, but today I'm not going to talk really about salvation other than that. What I want to do is I want to tell you and talk to you about the responsibilities that you and I have because we're a part of the family. Because we're a part of the family. Now, there's a, there's, there's a, and again, this is what I want you to do. I told the men this too. There's the three R's. You need to go through the three R's. Every time you hear anybody speak or you, you listen to something on, online or whatever, you need to receive it first of all. I mean, you can't do nothing, anything unless you receive it, Right? Then you need to research it with this, not with, not with other books or anything like that. Those are great. God gave them to, tools so we can learn, so that we can bring it back to this and make sure that it's right. Amen? And then we need to react. How many of you ever, have ever been told something and you reacted before you actually researched it and found out that you reacted incorrectly because you didn't research it, right? And so when I speak today, and, and, and hopefully you'll take notes and write some things down, and because this is another misconception, is that Sunday is for you to be fed. Sunday is supposed to be an appetizer for you to go home and eat during the week. If you're only eating on Sunday, uh, uh, you're, you're starving yourself spiritually, right? And you want to you figure it out, only eat at lunch today, and then don't eat until next Sunday after church, right? <laughs> Physically. Because the physical mirrors the spiritual, the family, how it works, right? We have a, a physical uh, family, father, son, brother, right? We also have a spiritual father, son, brothers, right? Sisters as well. The, the, the family still works together, all right? And so today what I'm going to talk to you about is about, um, about what our responsibility is as children. Again, you can't earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do, but once you have it, there's things you need to do with it. Amen? Some of y'all are like, I don't know if I want to hear this, man. I don't know how to do something. 
The verse that I that I that I uh, talked about this whole weekend that I started every service off with was uh, in um, Acts chapter seventeen, uh, and it was when Paul and Silas came to uh, Thessalonica, and they were there, and they were starting to teach, and he he taught for three weeks because it said he taught three Sabbath, and there's Sabbath is the seventh day, so he taught for three Sabbaths, three weeks, and then. They were upset and frustrated and mad, the Jews were, because of what he said. And so they went and got some people, and they wanted to run them out of town. And this is what they said to the magistrates. It says, it says, and when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here. You know, we need to turn this world upside down for Jesus. We need to turn this world upside down and have this world turn back towards him. Amen? Amen. So today, again, we're going to go into um, our responsibilities. And, and again, when you were kids or were your kids in your house, they had responsibilities. You got to take out the trash. You got to fold your laundry. You got to clean up your dishes after dinner, right? How many of y'all still do that? Okay. I hope you do. <laughs> like, you gotta teach, and that teaches you, that teaches our children that there are things that have to be done. And because they're a part of the, like when a guest comes from the house, I'm not like, all right, it's time to get up and sweep the floor. Go ahead. You're here in the house. Right? No, only the family does those things. Yeah. So when we start looking about what we're supposed to do, um, we need to, uh, we need to understand that there's things that have to come. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 28 says, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem they, them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. We urge you, brothers, to admonish the idle, to encourage the faint-hearted, to help the weak, to be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in every circumstance, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You want to know what the will of God is for you in your life? I mean, that's one of the questions that I get asked as a pastor. They're like, what's the will of God? What's the purpose? Like, what it is? Right here is black and white, right? Don't repay evil for evil. Always seek to do good. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we're to do as children of God. Right? The next thing it says is, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Receive, research, react. And hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. There's some things that as Christ followers, we are supposed to do. My kids, have fun. Learn about Jesus. It's important. It's important. So the first thing that we need to do as as children of God, and, and guys, this is one of our one of our points from yesterday, but I'm going to reiterate it again, is that we are to love others. If you notice in, in the, the scripture that I read before, it says, always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So we're not just supposed to love and be good to the people that are in here. We're supposed to do it to everybody. Even the annoying people that take 35 items into the 10 item or less aisle at the store. You know what I mean? How I many? Preaching, right? I get, man, I'm going to tell you, it, it burns me up, right? Especially in traffic, right? You're supposed to love everyone. Yeah, it's like, uh, this is difficult. I don't know if this Christian thing is for me anymore. I can't do that. <laughs> but now we're supposed to love everyone. Everyone. Even the people that are unlovable. Just think, sometimes you're unlovable. I'm not, my wife would be like, amen, if I said I was unlovable sometimes, right? <laughs> but this is what John 15, I'm going to read 12 and 13, then I'm going to skip to 17. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one than this that someone would lay down his life for his friends. These things I command you so that you will love one another. He gives us everything that we need to do what he's called us to do. 
In his word, in this book right here, he's given us every principle to be able to walk out the life that he's asked us to walk out. And again, this isn't for salvation. He gives us that. It's so that other people will come to know his love, grace, and mercy because of you and me. Amen? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So, when I was a youth pastor at, at Celebration Church, uh, and it was a freedom church at this time, because we had just started out, we, we were running the dental campus, and myself had, had started the youth group there, and, and uh, we decided, I don't know why, but we decided to take the kids to Gulf Shore for the day, right? Like, for the day. So we got up like 5 o'clock at the church, and we drove four, four and a half hours, over there, we stopped at Lambert's and eat. This is a, I don't even have any, like they're not sponsoring me or anything, but Lambert's is amazing. If you decide to go that way, I'm just saying. But we went there, then we went to the mall a little bit, then we played at the at the, the, the beach for a couple hours, then we turned around and drove all the way back home. That was a very, very long day, right? But it was, it was, it was good, and we ate, and we played, and it was fun. But on the way down there, we were driving down the main road when you get off and, and, and head towards Foley. We get off there, and we were driving down, and uh, we passed one of those places with the big, like, cement chickens or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Like the six-foot roosters that are, like, I, I, I don't understand. But it's there, and you can purchase it if you like. When we were driving past that, my, my pastor, Pastor Blood at the time, but what he called me, and he said, hey, man, did you see that? I'm like, you mean the six-foot rooster? He's like, no. He said, the angry Christians. And I said, I said, yeah, man. So we pulled to this stop sign and we're sitting there and they're yelling at our car with signs saying, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. I'm like, man, first of all, you don't even know me. Second of all, you're not going to get me to stop going there by saying that to me. Right? How many of you are going to listen to somebody yelling at you about what you need to do? I mean, it didn't work for my parents. It's not going to work for other people either. Right? So... So they're yelling and yelling and yelling at us, and I'm, and I'm a Christ, Christ follower, and it made me angry. Do you know what? If we do things and we don't do them in love, so it doesn't say to do things because we love. It says to do them in love. There's a difference. As children of God, we are supposed to love everyone, even the ones that do you wrong. You know, Jesus still died for the men that plucked his beard out. He still died for them. Whether they received it or not, that's on them. But he died for them. Amen? So, if he's going to do that, and we're going to be Christ followers, little, little Christ is what the term Christian was about. If we're going to be that, then we need to love everyone. Everyone. So how do we do it? You skip down to verse 4 in that section that says, Love is patient, love is kind. Does not love, uh, love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. You know, that's one of the things that, people, that, that Christians are good at, insisting on if you don't do it exactly the way that I say you're supposed to do it, then you're wrong. Do you know what, man? Me and my brother have completely different ideas, but he's still part of my family. Because every family has to have a crazy uncle, right? <laughs> anyway. Instead of arguing about what the Word of God says, let's come together and, and, and bring people to Jesus. Man. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not reject, rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. Then we're going to skip down to verse 13. It says, and so now faith Hope and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You know, I had a rough time kind of figuring that out for a little bit because without faith, it's impossible to please God because he who comes to God must go believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is super important. Without faith, you can't become a child, right? But this says that love is even more important than faith. And some of us need to change the way we love people, the way we treat people. The second thing that we're supposed to do as children of God, our responsibility, our chore, is to encourage each other. 
Encourage each other. Hebrews 10, 23 and 24 says this, 25, and I might even quote 26. I'm going to we'll just see what happens. It says this, it says, let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Again, firm foundation. I'd go through anything because I'll make it in him. Right? I, I, I'm holding fast to that and I'm not going to let go of it. And then it says this in 24, it says, and let us consider how to stir one another, stir up one another to love and to good works. Let me try to figure out ways that I can encourage you to walk in a Christly manner, in a godly way. I, my job as a, a child of God is to encourage my brothers and sisters and those who haven't come to see him yet that, that, that should be my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Because it says God wills that none should perish. Right? That I am supposed to, my job is to encourage you to do good things. To use the gifts that he's given you. So we all have different gifts. We all preach in different ways. Pastor Bobby preaches different than me. I preach different than my pastor. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of, lot of us that, that are completely different in how we operate. If everybody preached like me, we'd laugh a lot. But there's some serious stuff needs to happen too. Right? There's some people that because I make them laugh, they won't listen to me about what the Word of God says. Right? There's some people because of the way I dress won't listen to me because of what God says. Now, this is a, just so you know, I chase squirrels a lot. Like, I'm like, oh, look, there it is. And, and I do that in the Word of God. But, but one, of the things, one of the things is, is, man, we need, to, we, need, we need to not judge people by the way they look, by what they do. Because, listen, I was, a, I was a drunk 24 years ago. I used to stumble and drunk sitting on the back row of the church that I am now the pastor. People would look at me like, why are you here? And if my father hadn't been the pastor, I would have never stepped foot back in that place. We need to allow everyone to come to know his love, grace, and mercy, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what they did last night. Let's get back to it. Then it says this in 25. Everybody's like, do I have to go to church to be a Christ follower? Christian, you don't have to, but you don't have to have a, a parachute to jump out of an airplane either. It sure <laughs> helps, right? Like we... Can, but Hebrews 10 25 says not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near you guys look around man the day's going to boast and come back I know it's I know it's been getting closer all the time that's how it works like I'm older now than I was five minutes ago I'm older now than I was when I first started the sentence right so it just keeps going we're getting closer and closer and closer but we need to encourage people we need to not neglect coming together why because me encourage listen the enemy wants to get you away from people so he can attack you yes. we were talking about that yesterday and the thought process it was in that it was in our our, our, our breakout session that we had, and, 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 and what I started thinking about was a lion. Have you guys ever seen lions hunt? Again, it says that, that the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can devour. If you've ever seen lions hunt, they pick the weakest one and they all attack him together. The one that they can get away from everyone else. Do you know what the enemy wants to do? To get you away from everyone else. To get you where you withdraw inside, where you don't get around people that are going to strengthen and encourage and pray. God answers prayers. He answers prayers. People that are going to pray for you, they, they, he wants you to think that you're all alone in what you're going through and nobody's ever gone through it before. But this is the thing. If you look around this room, the situation that you're in right now, that you're struggling with, there's, there's one of three people in this place around you. There's a person that's gone through it already. There's a person that's going through it right now. And there's a person that's going to go through in the future. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We need to encourage others with what God has done inside of us. Amen? The next thing we need to do is we need to feed people. One of the things I'm pretty happy about today is that we get to spiritually eat and then physically eat afterwards. I saw the pies and cakes in there. Man, I didn't even see the, the hot food coming in yet, but I'm excited already. That's one of the things Christ followers do really good. We eat really well. We're like, come on, let's get together. Let's hang out. What do we want to do? Well, I don't know. Let's go eat. Right? <laughs> We're supposed to feed people 
both physically and spiritually. Both physically and spiritually. Let me ask you this. When is the last time that you invited someone over to your home to have dinner with the sole purpose of speaking to them about Jesus afterwards? When's the last time that you invited one of the people in these seats over to your house for dinner or out to the park to eat, wherever you want to go, out to the restaurant with the sole thought process of let's discuss God's word? When's the last time we did that? Some of you are like, well, I ain't never done that. Maybe I should start, <laughs> right? Maybe we should start doing that. Maybe we should start doing that. Because again, man, if you if you only eat on Sunday morning, and uh, kind of you like this one, uh, well, the pastor that was there before me, he said he said I used to get frustrated when people would leave the church and they would go and they were, and I was really frustrated until one person said this. He said they came to him and said, I'm just not being fed here. And he, you know what? This is what I like his response. His response was, man, I got a two year old can feed himself. Oh. Wow. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're only dwelling on spiritual food from this place right here, and you're not feeding yourself. So at our church, we don't have a worship leader. I have it for a year and almost a year and three months since January. Just four months now, right? We haven't had one, so we've been doing Spotify worship. The good thing is nobody that sings in the, on the playlist sings the wrong note or plays the wrong note on the instruments, right? They're always dead on with that one. But I had some people come to me and say, man, I can't worship because nobody's here. And I'm like, well... Can I get on the list of the people that come to your house and sing during the week so you can worship? I want a live band to come to my house so I can worship. Because if you, if you can't worship with this kind of music now, what are you doing at home? Is that the only time that you worship God? In this house? We need to feed people both physically and spiritually. Jesus told Simon Peter this. John 21, 15 through 17. What I like is we remember that Peter denied Jesus three times. And, and I'm going to show you something on this story that I really, really like. Ready? John 21, 15 through 17. This is after Christ to come back. He says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, son of, son of God, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, so do you realize, hold on, stop. You realize they didn't have no sheep around him at that time? He wasn't talking about a little lamb, Mary's little lamb. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the men that were there. Feed them. Feed them. He said to Simon a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he said, tend my sheep. He put it in a different way, but he said, tend my sheep. Feed them. Look after them. And he said this to John, to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time. Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And he said, Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Do you realize that he denied him three times? And he gave him three times. Tell him he loved him. You guys see that? But what did he say? Because you love me, there's some things you need to do. Because we're part of the family, there's some things we need to do. We need to feed people, both physically and spiritually. I told the guys, I'm, I'm going to tell the story. One day, I was getting off. I used to work at, at Relief Windows, and I was I was going there, and I had my lunch, and it was one of those days that I had to obey my wife, because she, like, when we got married, I'm just going to be real. Oh, I forgot to tell you, my wife and kids are over there. Hi, wife. Love you guys. So, I, my wife said, you can't, speak. when we got married, I said, hey, you're going to take care of the money, because if something goes wrong, I got somebody to yell at. If I'm using it, I can yell at her. I, I don't get to yell at that often, but because um, she takes care of it. I call and say, can I? And that day she said, no, right? She said, here, here's the lunch, you eat that, right? I'm like, but, but, and she said, no, this is your lunch, you eat that, right? If y'all know my wife, y'all know that's funny because she don't talk like that, but anyway. <laughs> so I'm getting off on Segan Lane, man, and I'm about to turn to go to our old shop that was there, and, and I get off, and there's a guy standing there with a sign. I'm hungry, I need some food. And the Holy Spirit said, give me your lunch. 
I'm like, but that's my lunch. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I heard you right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I didn't. And he said, no, give him your lunch. I said, but if I give him my lunch and I ain't gonna have nothing, he said, give him your lunch. So I wrote in my mind, I'm like, sure, have my lunch. <laughs> So frustrated and aggravated, man. I was so, so, but but that day, because I was supposed to be out in the field all day doing stuff, I uh, was one of the supervisors, supposed to be running around doing stuff. So that day, I had to come back to the office about 11:30, and I walked into the office. And Brandon, the owner, man, I've known him since he was like this hot, right? Because we grew up in Florida. I grew up with his cousin; he was my best friend, so I've known him forever. And he looked at me and he said, "He said, hey, man, we haven't caught up in a while. Let's go to lunch. I'm buying. Do you know?" Not, nothing against your lunch, babe. But do you know that I had a way better lunch than what was in that sandwich bag? Right? Like, sorry, babe. Way better lunch. But why? Because God said to do something and I did it because of it. He blessed me. Do you know when you begin to feed people both physically and spiritually, that verse that everybody uses in it, so there's, there's a lot of verses that people use in the wrong place, right? The principle works, but it's not what it said. So you guys have all heard it offering because my mom gets so mad at me when I use this one. You, you know that, that everybody use give and it will be given back to you, press down, shake together when they take up offering, right? Principle works. But if you read the context of that, he's not talking about money. He's talking about forgiveness and judgment, right? So I'm going to tell you this and tell you the principle still works, even though it's not about what the Bible used it about, right? It's the principle behind it. When you give, God gives back to you. When you, when you, when, when you give, it will be given back to you, and he'll use people to do it. He'll use people to do it, Right? We need to feed people. We need to feed people. The next thing that we need to do, number four, we need to evangelize. You say, well, I'm not an evangelist. You're right. But let me tell you something. The gifts that God has, he allows people to operate in them, even though they're not, that's not their main task. You know what? Sometimes God's going to give you a word of knowledge for you to speak into somebody's life. He's going to tell you something and you're supposed to say it to them. Even though that's not, that's not what you do all the time. Do you know that we all are supposed to evangelize? 2 Corinthians 5, 11 says this. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you a cause to boast about us. So that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what the heart is. Do you know we as people look on the outward appearance and skip hard? That's why, that's why people can pretend to be Christ followers on Sunday and they go out and live their life however they want to Monday through Friday or Saturday. Right? And then come back here and pretend that, like they're the holiest people in the world. You know what, man? Don't pretend nothing. Be you. Because God's the one that sees it. He's the one that's going to judge it. I love y'all, but I really don't care what you think when it comes to my salvation. Right? Because he's the only one that I have to please. I mean, I hope that you're happy and all, but I'm going for him first, right? For if we were beside ourselves, verse 13, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He died for all, that those who might live, who live, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for, for their sake died and was raised. I want to skip down to verse 18. It says, all this is from God through who through Christ reconciled him to his, us to himself. Let me start over. That was jacked up. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we 
are ambassadors for Christ. Do you know how many people don't love God because of his children? Do you know parents get blamed for everything? Like when I was a kid, I was in my bed. Like I told y'all, the, the, like God, uh, the father disciplines the ones that he loved. My dad really loved me as a kid, right? <laughs> like really loved me as a kid. I deserved almost all of it. There was that one time, but we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> He's given to us this message, man. He's given to us this opportunity to share his love, grace, and mercy. And we need to do it. We need to do it. Again, parents get blamed for what kids do. When I was a kid and went up to bed and I did dumb stuff, you know who they were mad at? They weren't mad at me, I mean, kind of, but they were mad at my mom and dad. Why? Because my mom and dad should have taught me better. Do you know my mom and dad taught me the best they could teach me? It's probably better than most kids got taught, but I'm a knucklehead. Like I told the guys earlier, it's like, don't touch this pulpit. I mean, you mean this one? This is the one you don't need to touch. I'm not going to touch this one because you said don't touch this one, right? That was me as a kid, right? Now i got a 13-year-old daughter that's exactly me and a 13-year-old daughter, right? Just kidding. You're not that bad. This close. <laughs> but there's so many people that blame God because of his children. Um, I think it was... Uh, I think it was Gandhi who said, your Christ I like, it's your Christians I don't like. I wish your Christians could be more like your Christ. Mm. Mm. Do you know the world thinks that too? There's people that will not come to church. I don't understand the statement. And I'm going to explain it in a minute. They, they, they won't come to church because there are too many hypocrites in church. But they still go to Walmart, don't they? Right? I'm just saying... Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who know no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We're ambassadors, man. We're supposed to show people what God wants to do, who he wants to be in their lives by what he does in our life. And we need to tell them. Again, when's the last time you made it a point to tell somebody about Jesus? That's our job as a, as a Christ follower. We have to do that. We have that responsibility. The next thing, discipleship. We're supposed to disciple people. As I talked to you guys, and I said just briefly earlier, how, how there's a spiritual family, a physical family, there's a spiritual family. So I have a, I have a, a spiritual father who taught me a lot of things. I have a couple of them. One of them was here last night. He's the one that got me and Mo doing. We couldn't go to Bible college, but we wanted to be ministers. And so he's like, hey, come with me. Every Tuesday we'll meet. There was four of us and we met. The first message we ever preached, it was me and Mo and Ron and John. And we all had five minutes to preach. We had, we had this stuff. I'm just going to say, some of us talked way more than five, had way more notes than what was supposed to happen in five minutes, and some of us read through the notes and had to start again because we still had two and a half minutes left, right? <laughs> read through the notes again, right? Management. We we're kind of we're new, you know? But we're supposed to disciple people. I, I have people that discipled me. I have spiritual fathers. I also have spiritual brothers. Me and Mo. There's others as well. That He's my spiritual brother. Right? There's older brothers, there's younger brothers, there's, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. But we're brothers that learn from the same father, right? But then we're supposed to have spiritual children as well. Everything God gives you, you're supposed to give to somebody else. That's why he gave it to you. He didn't give it to you to keep. He gave it to you to give. Everything that he's given to you. Let me ask you this. Who is a spiritual child to you? Or not, not spiritual child, because some people don't grow. But who is one of your spiritual children that you're taking under your wing that have just come to know Christ and teaching them the word of God and what it means to be a Christ follower? You know what? That's part of the problem with the church today. There's no discipleship. Say this prayer and you're part of the family. All right, you're on your own. And then you have people that don't understand the word of God trying to teach people the word of God. And that's where the false doctrines come in. 
That's where the things that sound really biblical, but aren't. Again, spare the rod, spoil the child. It's not in the Bible. Spare the rod, you hate your child, is what the scripture says. Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's not in the Bible. I mean, I hope everybody in here showered this morning, but it, it, you see what I'm saying? It's a good one, but it's not a God one. We need to disciple people so that they understand the word of God. We're supposed to have a spiritual family. This is supposed to be a faith family, not a church. You're supposed to be able to come to your brothers and sisters that are here, to the fathers that are in the house, spiritual fathers, and, and, and help the spiritual children. That's what we're supposed to do. That's called discipleship. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they had saw him, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You know it doesn't say go and make Christians. It says make disciples. Speak into people's lives of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says this, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We're supposed to be sharing what God has given to us. Do you know if we don't get in his word and learn and he doesn't speak to us through his word, we don't have anything to give? Look, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real. Some, some things, some things in the word of God are black and white. This is how it is. Some things are, are, are. You can't do this. Don't do this. You know, there's like ten of them. Start off with like the big ones. Anyway, there's don't do these things. Those aren't. Those aren't for Christ followers. Because when I have a relationship with Him and I'm following Him and I'm walking by His Spirit, I'm not going to do those things. He said, if I, Jesus said, if I, if I love people the way I'm supposed to, all of the commandments will be taken care of. So I don't have to worry about, am I doing this? Am I doing that? Can I do this? Or can I not do that? Ask God. He'll tell you. And then be obedient. That's why the Holy Spirit gives us self-discipline, self-control. Some of us need to exercise. That kill for a little bit. But we're supposed to teach others. And then the last point. I think it's my last point. Yep, it's my last point. Y'all ready? <laughs> I only got six more. Let's do this. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, I'm hungry. I smell chicken. Um, <laughs> the last point is this. We are to serve people. The, the most important things out of all these lists, they're all important. Love is the, the most important. But I believe, I believe that serving is the next important. I'm going to explain why. Mark 9, 35, and he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and the servant of all. You know, no, but he, he walks from next door, so I know you don't have one of these. But do you know it cracks me up when I drive into churches and they got the, the, the covered parking only for the pastor and the spots right in the front row? I... I, I Look, man, I mean, honor your pastor, yes. You're supposed to give double honor to your pastor, yes. But you know what, man? I'd much rather have the visitors park right by the front door and honor them because they're here, yes. right? Yes. I, I'd rather have, I'd rather have a, we don't have any spots or signs or anything because we, we don't really have a parking lot. We've got a parking grass all around our church, right? Yeah. That's a little redneck church in the middle of it anyway. It's one of those things. We just park in the grass. But I would much rather, if I had signs, I wouldn't put them up for the pastor and for the elders. I'd put them up for the visitors. Hey, this is your first time here? Park right in the front row, man. We're glad you are here. We want to serve you. We want to serve you. We, we, we want to take care of you. What can I do? Hey, man, you're new. Would you like a cup of coffee? I'm going to show you where it's at. Or, or I'll just make it for you and bring it back. What do you like in it? We're supposed to serve people. We're not supposed to be walked on. Right? There's a difference between serving and being walked on. Okay? But we're supposed to serve people, man. If we look at Jesus' life, everything he did was not about himself. That, no, well, let me take that back. Do you know the only thing he did for himself? He got himself away with him and God so that he could be recharged to do what God called him to do. 
He went, he went and prayed by himself. He went, he, went, he went to the mountaintop, to the desert for 40 days. That's when the enemy attacked him. One of the things, one of the things I want you to understand, too, that this was a statement that was made earlier, that, that we are going to go through trials. We are going to go through problems. And, and let, me, let me tell you this. If you are not being tempted or going through trials, I want you to reevaluate your life with Christ. Because the enemy is not going to mess with you when you're doing what, what, what he wants you to do. Right? So if you're not facing struggles, you're not facing battles, you're not going through things and having to rely on God. Yes, there are mountaintops, but there's also some valleys. And do you know when you're alone, again, as we said earlier, that's when the enemy is going to attack you. So when you get alone with God, man, make sure you know something stupid is going to happen. Toilet's going to overflow or the, kick, the stuff's going to stop. You guys get what I'm saying? Yeah. Something's going to happen to get you to come away. And I want to encourage you this, man. Be mindful of what the enemy does. So um, we were kids pastors at a place called Heartsey Stuff County Car and Counter Church over, by, over on uh, Florida. And uh, that when we were kids pastors, right? And, and one, one day, one day, my, my wife had a headache. And when we got up that morning, she's like, man, my head's really hurting. Do you mind if I just stay home? Now, we were kids pastors, and we, it was like old school kids pastors. I don't know how y'all, it was like old school. We did Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We always, we didn't have relief. We did. That's what we did, four and a half years. That's what we did. If we were out of town, somebody else did it, but it was us. One Sunday morning, she's like, man, I've got a headache, man. Can I, can I just stay home? I'm like, yeah, man, go ahead and relax. And, Take care of stuff and yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just rest up. I went. I did kids church. Um, we did all kinds of stuff we weren't supposed to that day because she wasn't there to train us out. But, um, but do you know for the next six months, only on Sundays she would wake up with a headache. Why? I got you once. I'm gonna get you again. He'd say, "Well, he just said if I have a headache, I can't. I need to come to church anyway." Well, I mean, if you're sick, right? Don't come to church. You gonna get somebody else sick? Stay at home. You know, study your word yourself. But don't allow the enemy to keep attacking you in the same spot. Realize the attacks of the enemy. And if he can get you to not serve people, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Again, he said we have to be serving them all. Like Mark 10, 43 uh, through 45, it said, But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be the great would be great among you must be the servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So how are we supposed to do it? How are we supposed to serve people? Have y'all ever seen a little kid that was told to sit down and didn't want to sit down, and they made him sit down? And, and the look that he gave you was, I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Y'all seen it before. Y'all seen it. Y'all might, might do that sometimes, right? <laughs> do you know that we're supposed to do what God has called us to do with a good heart? With a good heart. You know it says that God loves a cheerful giver. It doesn't say he loves a giver. It says he loves a cheerful giver. God looks at the heart when we do what we do. 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10. This is a rough one, y'all. Get ready. It says, show hospitality to everyone without grumbling. Without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very graces. You know, we're supposed to serve other people the way Jesus served us. You know, he gave us everything. He gave us everything. You know, you know, he did it with a cheerful heart, even though he didn't want to do it. God, like, what do you say you want to do? He's like, God, let this cup pass for me. If it's all available, I don't want to do this. But not my will. I want to do what you want me to do, Father. Do you know when you start serving people, you're going to have to do things that you don't want to do. You're going to have to give up some things that you really like to do to serve other people at certain times. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody, nobody wants to hear, i got to give things up to be able to serve him. There's stuff I can't do. This is what I want you to, this is a, a thought process that I have. I got it the other night, when, when, or the other day, when we had a missionary in from Africa, and, and uh, they, they're from Louisiana too, but they came down and he was speaking. And this is something that God kind of dropped in my spirit. It wasn't one of his points, but he dropped it in my spirit. He was like, 
instead of, instead of asking myself before I do something, is this sin? As a child of God, I should be asking myself, does this draw me away from my purpose? Because according to, to Paul, he says not everything that slows us down is sin. Remember, he says, throw off every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. So some things that keep us from doing what God wants us to do aren't sin. They're just not going to help us. They're not going to help us. Think this thought, a race, like a runner running a race. When they come out on the, on, to get ready, you notice they're all in track suits and, and, and heavy clothes and, and they walk out there, why? Because they stretched all out, they want to keep their muscles loose and they're, they're all that stuff and, 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 and keep warm so they're ready to go when it comes. But right before they race, what do they do? They strip down into almost nothing and run. Why? Because they want to take off everything that could possibly slow them down. Do you know as Christ followers, we need to take off every weight slows us down and we need to run the race that's set before us looking to Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith we need to put our eyes on what God has called us to and we need to run as fast as we can we need to love people we need to encourage people we need to disciple people and evangelize tell them about Jesus and we need to serve people so my question to you this morning before I pass the, pass the microphone back over just a second, is what are you going to do with the information you've just been given? How are you going to allow the Word of God to change your life so that you can encourage, you can build, you can love, you can serve people? What do you need to lay down? If, 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 if the Holy Spirit works in your life like He does in my life, he just showed you something. Are you going to be obedient? Are you going to lay it down? Best place to do it is in his house right now. But right? so I'm, I'm going to, this is a squirrel, but I'm going to tell you this. Y'all know what one of my favorite parts in the scripture is? It's when Moses comes to the Pharaoh and they got frogs. Right? You remember when he got frogs? And Moses said to the Pharaoh, he's like, when do you want me to get rid of them? He's like, tomorrow. Like, wait, wait a minute. No, I want them frogs on right now. Like, like, I bet you if all of Egypt knew he said tomorrow, they'd all be mad at him. Right? When do you want him gone? Tomorrow. Do you know if the enemy can get us to put off till tomorrow getting ready things in our lives? Sometimes tomorrow never come. Procrastinators unite tomorrow. You understand what I'm saying? There's always going to be tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to lay things down and to make your life right and to become a child of God and take care of the things God's put in our heart to do and given us to do. Amen? Amen. Jesus, did you guys come back up from here? I probably should have said that like a minute or two. My bad. <laughs> Remember, they just put the blood in the back for me and my church. <laughs> 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 Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. We thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. We thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. I, I want to take just a few minutes, man. And, and I want to give you an opportunity. I want you to play a song. I don't know what you're going to play. I want, I want you to play something. And this is what I want, I want, I want you to do. Now, you, you can give everything that you have that you're going to give to them from your seat. I mean, you know, you can accept Jesus from your seat. You can accept Jesus from the car. You can change your life from the car. But do you know why I like the altars? You know why I like it? Because it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's like we have to do if we're going to be a child of God. We believe in our heart. We confess to them out. It's a step of faith saying, God, I'm going to give you this right now. So as they sing, what I want you to do, if you, if you want to, if you want to stay in your seat and, and do it there, you can do it. But the holy people are going to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you want to give something to God today, come do it. Come do it. I'm going to pray, and then they're going to start singing. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Father God. We thank you, man, that every day you give us an opportunity to live for you. We may mess up today, but tomorrow's a new day.